Today, it is a special presentation of Double B for Victory, Black Americans, World War II, and the Civil Rights Movement, hosted by Forever Scholars and Professor Jill Ogline Titus. Uh, my name is Anthony Hannon, and I will be your Forever Scholars moderator today. Before we begin, I just want to mention a few things, just some housekeeping. Um, if you have questions during the lecture, please put them in the Q&A box, and we will be answering them during the Q&A portion of the presentation. And the structure is 45-minute lecture, followed by a 15 minute discussion. Professor Jill Ogline Titus is also hosting a course with Forever Scholars. Her course is Rethinking Mid 20th Century Black Freedom Struggle. It's a five part course. Each session in the series features a 60 minute lecture followed by a 30 minute class discussion. And this is all live. And it's a really great way to learn about the topic and take a deep dive into the material with the guidance of Professor Titus. So if you'd like to learn more about this class and register, you can visit foreverscholars.com or you can use the link, which I'm going to drop in the chat window now. <clears throat> and I also just want to mention that we are also offering a deal for this class for today. So if you register today, or you did previously, you're gonna receive a signed copy of Professor Titus's award-winning book, Gettysburg, 1963, Civil Rights, Cold War Politics, and Historical Memory in America's Most Famous Small Town. So you will get a signed copy if you register for the course today, but you can also purchase a signed copy on its own um, on our site. And I'm gonna put that link in the chat as well. So if you wanna just purchase a signed copy, you can do that as well. So now, without further delay, I would like to introduce Professor Jill Ogline Titus. Professor Titus is Associate Director of the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College and co-coordinator of the college's public history minor. She is the author of Gettysburg 1963, Civil Rights, Cold War Politics, and Historical Memory in America's Most Famous Small Town, which is the winner of the 2022 Willie Lee Rose Prize from Southern Association for Women Historians which again, you will receive a signed copy of that if you register for the class today, and you can also purchase that assigned copy on its own. And her first book, Brown's Battleground Students, Segregationists, and the Struggle for Justice in Prince Edward County was a finalist for the Library of Virginia Literary Award. Welcome, Professor Titus. It is so we are so happy to have you. And Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And I should just preface this by saying, please don't let the Civil War Institute fool you much as I love it. I am not a Civil War historian. I am a mid 20th century US historian sort of focused on the civil rights era. So this course is going to be very much in, in my wheelhouse. And, and I'm looking forward to um, engaging with folks on it. So for today, I do have a PowerPoint to share with everybody. Let me get that open. Okay. So I thought we would start with something interestingly uh, visual, um, some recruiting posters. During World War II, recruiting posters aimed at African Americans used images of famous Black Americans like boxer Joe Lewis and Pearl Harbor hero Dory Miller to send the message that Black men and women were needed and wanted in the American military and that their service would be rewarded and respected. But the reality of the relationship between World War II and the Black struggle for freedom and dignity was, of course, far more complex than these images would suggest. So Joe Lewis, just for a second, in, in the wake of his 1936 victory over German boxer Max Schmeling, Lewis became really a symbol of opposition to Nazi ideas about Aryan racial superiority. When he and Schmeling squared off in 1938 for their famous rematch, 100 million people turned in worldwide to hear the fight build as a confrontation between democracy and fascism. Even Franklin Roosevelt weighed in, uh, sending Lewis a cable saying, you know, Joe, we're depending on those muscles for America. And African-Americans North and South really celebrated the 
elevation of one of their own as the nation's champion. Lewis enlisted in the U.S. Army not long after Pearl Harbor and soon became the face of a recruitment campaign aimed at encouraging Black men to enlist in the Army. He headlined this uh, 1942 recruitment poster and this 1944 orientation film that was directed by Frank Capra of It's a Wonderful Life fame that was shown to many recruits, both white and Black, during basic training. The poster itself broke ground as one of the first widely circulated images of a Black soldier actively using his weapon. Remember, we have to think about context here. You know, many white Americans in 1942 were still deeply uncomfortable with the idea of Black service members and liable to see a Black man with a gun as a threat, not a defender. So this was considered a breakthrough. In response to of legitimizing a military that was still quite segregated, Lewis's response was always the same. He would say, you know, there are lots of things wrong with America, but Hitler isn't going to fix them. So again and again, his focus was to shift the conversation from America's record on race to Nazi Germany's, encouraging Black Americans to prioritize destroying fascism first and then turn their attention to correcting American racial abuses. Lewis was never in combat, and he spent most of his enlistment promoting Black recruitment and fighting in exhibitions. But despite his celebrity status, he was no stranger to the humiliations endured by Black soldiers. He did basic training in a segregated unit. He often responded to racial discrimination on the bases that he visited by refusing to box for segregated audiences. During one tour, a white MP ordered Lewis and another Black boxer, Sugar Ray Robinson, to move to the colored side of the bus depot. The two refused, and they were hauled to the guardhouse. But unlike countless other Black soldiers who took similar stands, they were quickly released. The posters featuring Lewis as, you know, featuring Lewis presented Black soldiers as courageous defenders of American democracy in the face of Nazi threats. But the reality of the Brown Bombers military service makes it clear that Black service members fight for democracy was very much on two fronts, to defend it abroad and to actually achieve it at home. Lewis's counterpart in wartime propaganda was Dory Miller, who came to fame for his courageous actions at Pearl Harbor. As Japanese planes swept over the bridge of the USS West Virginia, Miller helped move his wounded captain out of the line of fire, and then at his own initiative, took over an unmanned anti-aircraft gun, keeping up a steady round of fire until he ran out of ammunition. And that, of course, would have been courageous action under any circumstances, but it was made more so by the fact that Miller had no gunnery training. Black sailors in the U.S. Navy were restricted to behind-the-scenes roles, like stewards, cooks, and in Miller's case, mess attendants. So in seeing what needed to be done and doing it despite lack of training for the role, he went above and beyond the call of duty. In May 1942, Dory Miller became the first African-American in U.S. history to receive the Navy Cross for courage under fire. His commanding officer then sent him on a fundraising tour to inspire civilians to buy war bonds and created that recruitment picture that I should poster that I showed you that used his image to promise prospective Black sailors that their service to the United States would be respected and honored. But Miller's initial emergence as a symbol of Black heroism was due more to agitation on the part of Black Americans than deep gratitude on the part of the U.S. Navy. In the initial news stories coming out of Pearl Harbor, Miller was mentioned only as an unnamed Black man. His identification and recognition as a war hero took place only in the wake of repeated prodding by the NAACP and at a time in which the Navy stood to gain by recognizing a Black sailor. Despite the widespread use of Dory Miller's heroism to boost recruitment amongst African-Americans, 
when his ship went down in the South Pacific in November of 1943, the Navy was still a rigidly segregated organization. There were almost no paths to advancement available to black sailors. The first African-American naval officers wouldn't be commissioned until the following year. And Miller himself, despite his actions at Pearl Harbor, had been promoted no farther than ship's cook third class. In life and death, Dory Miller was a symbol, but of what exactly? of World War II as a watershed moment in the history of the struggle for Black civil rights, or of the limitations of the war years, the limitations of the, the promises that they offered. What I want to do today is, is sort of try to answer that question. It's clear that the war years open new opportunities, you know, economically, socially, and militarily to African Americans but they also proved a profound disappointment to those who hoped for a lasting transformation in American race relations. I want to use our time together this afternoon to talk about some of the ways in which Black Americans experienced and responded to World War II and the impact of the war years in shaping the post-war civil rights movement. We'll look at some of the gains of the decade and the limitations of wartime reform. And we'll talk a little bit about the ways that Black veterans continued to fight for victory on the home front after VE Day and VJ Day. So it's often been argued that many white Americans started to back away from white supremacy during World War II because the atrocities of Nazi Germany offered such a hideous example of where obsession with racial purity could lead. And that is true to a certain extent. When the Nazi government passed the Nuremberg Laws, the Black press lost no time in pointing out that they were modeled on Jim Crow statutes. As Nazi persecution of those deemed inferior intensified, civil rights organizations hammered home the parallels between Nazi racial policies and American segregation, arguing that quote, the only essential difference between a Nazi mob hunting down Jews in Central Europe and an American mob burning Black men at the stake in Mississippi is that one is actually encouraged by its national government and the other is merely tolerated, end quote. But Black Americans did not, you know, sit around and wait for these messages to take hold amongst whites. Instead, they seized the opportunity the war offered to demand change by launching the Double V campaign. I imagine many of you are probably somewhat familiar with the way the famous wartime Double V campaign linked victory over fascism abroad to victory over segregation and racism at home. Double V was first laid out um, about a month after Pearl Harbor in a letter to the editor printed in the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the most widely read black papers in the country. The letter's author, um, James Thompson, who was a cafeteria worker at an aircraft plant in Kansas, asked questions that resonated really deeply with courier readers. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Will things be better for the next generation in the peace that follows this war? Is the kind of America I know even worth defending? The answer he ultimately proposed was to launch a two-pronged war effort with, as you see here, the first V for victory over our enemies from without, and the second for victory over our enemies from within. Two weeks after this letter ran in the Courier, the newspaper launched an official double V wartime campaign. The response from readers was, was really overwhelming. And within a few weeks, other black newspapers were taking up the call. The strategy of using the context of wartime needs, you know, labor, manpower, uh, military service, monetary support to provide leverage for racial justice certainly was not a new one. People of color had made use of it in previous wars in hopes of achieving you know, emancipation, ending slavery, winning white support for full citizenship rights. What was different about this campaign, the Double V campaign, was the willingness that many African Americans expressed, at least at the beginning of the war, 
to make Black support for the war effort conditional. We love our country, they insisted, but if you want us to help fight this war, we need to see a good faith effort to end racial discrimination. And if we don't see that, we're not going to help you fight it. Some Black men did answer James Thompson's question, should I sacrifice my life to live half American, with a resounding no. They argued that until Black Americans enjoyed the rights of citizenship, they shouldn't be expected to make the sacrifices expected of citizens. When he received his draft notification, Malcolm Little, later to be known as Malcolm X, reported for his physical determined to present himself as mentally unbalanced. He wore an outlandish outfit. He talked loudly and really enthusiastically about turning his gun on white crackers. He was declared unfit for service, classified as 4F. Some Black draftees took a more upfront approach, refusing on ethical grounds to serve in a segregated military and filing for conscientious objector status. Very, very few of them were granted it. Um, the vast majority of Black draft resistors served prison terms for draft evasion. But the majority of African Americans, the vast majority, chose other avenues for pursuing double V. Many joined civil rights organizations for the first time. During the war years, NAACP membership grew from about 50,000 to more than 400,000. And the bulk of the new members were in the South, um, where resistance was strongest. And I think that really tells us something about the spirit of determination that the double V campaign tapped into. Here you see a poster advertising the uh, NAACP's 1944 annual meeting. The influence of the war on shaping this imagery is obvious. You know, Jim Crow here is made anti-American by linking him to Germany and Japan, and he's shown to be in a vulnerable position, you know, almost within the organization's power to choke. As membership boomed, NAACP lawyers seized the moment to step up their attacks on the legal foundations of white supremacy, bringing suit in countless cases related to voter suppression, you know, school segregation, discrimination in employment, housing, transportation, from grassroots activists way up to the national leadership people at all levels of the organization also committed themselves to fighting for equal treatment for Black service members and against the racially discriminatory poll tax. Direct action protest took a big step forward during the war years as well. In 1942, an interracial group of pacifists committed to combating racial discrimination through direct action formed the Congress of Racial Equality, which is better known as CORE. While American troops fought for victory abroad, CORE activists used sit-ins to challenge racial discrimination at coffee shops and restaurants and skating rinks across Chicago. The tactic was quickly picked up by Black students at Howard University, who used it to break down cafeteria segregation in Washington, DC. By the late 1940s, Activists across the country were sitting in at segregated pools and parks. And drawing on the wartime use of sit-ins, core activists also launched a bus-based freedom ride in 1947. In our popular memory of the civil rights movement, sit-ins and freedom rides tend to be portrayed as new tactics um, pioneered during the 1960s. But this is less of a reflection of reality than it is a testimony to the extent to which the activism of the 1940s has been largely forgotten. The war also provided Black workers some new tools to combat rampant discrimination in employment. As industries shifted toward wartime production, hundreds of thousands of whites found relatively high-paying jobs, you know, positions that finally made the Depression history for them and for their families. But more than half of employers producing war-related goods or providing war-related services like transportation 
refused to hire any Black employees at all. And the vast majority of those that did relegated them to the lowest paying positions. This image um, you have in front of you right now depicts a long-term campaign spearheaded by the Philadelphia NAACP to get the city's transit company to hire Blacks in higher paying positions like trolley car drivers. For A. Philip Randolph, the leading Black figure in the American labor movement at the time, wartime production jobs offered the greatest potential for Black economic advancement that had been seen in generations. You know, these were jobs that paid high wages, they came with benefits and union membership, they offered opportunities to learn new skills. So thus, in the summer of 1941, Randolph used the threat of a massive march on Washington to pressure the White House to open up jobs in the defense industry to African-Americans. Organizers for Randolph's March on Washington movement canvassed tirelessly. By early summer, the threat of a quarter million dissatisfied African-Americans marching on the White House to demand protections for Black workers and the abolition of segregation in the military had become a real source of concern for Franklin Roosevelt. So of course, as we all know, you know, sitting presidents have all kinds of concerns when confronted with the prospect of mass demonstrations. But in addition to all of those usual concerns, Roosevelt also worried that the presence of so many Black demonstrators would call international attention to the fact that the nation's capital was a deeply segregated city. Parks, buses, restaurants, schools, hotels, restrooms, including some in federal buildings, were divided along racial lines. The humiliations of racial discrimination in DC were best summed up in this famous photograph, Gordon Parks's American Gothic, Washington, DC. Today, Gordon Parks is one of the best known photographers of the 20th century. But when he moved to DC in 1942, he was just another black man forced to deal with the humiliation of segregation. After an extraordinarily difficult first day in the city where he was turned away from restaurants, from potential apartments, so on and so forth, he spent the evening in his office building sharing stories with this woman, Ella Watson, who worked as a janitor in the building. And Parks was so deeply affected by the tragedy of Ella Watson's life story that he asked her to pose. If this looks familiar, there's a good reason why, you know, by modeling the shot on Grant Wood's famous American Gothic and substituting the American flag as the background image, Parks's intention was to demonstrate the gulf between national ideals and the nation's treatment of its Black citizens. Concern that a mass demonstration by Black workers would further highlight the gap between ideals and realities in the nation's capital Roosevelt offered a partial concession just a few weeks before the march was scheduled to take place. While refusing to order desegregation of the armed forces on the grounds that it would create chaos, he issued Executive Order 8802 in June 1941. The order banned employers receiving federal contracts from discrimination in hiring and created the Fair Employment Practices Commission, better known as the FEPC, to monitor complaints. Randolph was skeptical about how this would be enforced, but he recognized the order as a victory and agreed to cancel the march. As shown in this poster, federal agencies like the War Manpower Commission used the text of EO 8802 to call on employers and white employees alike to do the right thing and, and accept coworkers of any ethnic background as partners in the fight against fascism. By the end of the war, many more American factories looked something like this than they had at the beginning. The percentage of defense industry jobs held by African-Americans had increased from 3% to about 8%, and federal employment rates among Blacks were three times higher than they were in 1940. So employment gains, positive media coverage of figures like Joe Lewis and Dory Miller, 
big membership bump for the NAACP, fights against segregation in the courts and in public spaces. Clearly, there's evidence to suggest that World War II was a watershed moment for civil rights. But unfortunately, when you dig further into a lot of these things, many of the gains made over time proved to be either largely symbolic victories or just temporary improvements. As casualties mounted, most Black newspapers shelved their calls for withdrawal of support from the war effort if concrete changes on the home front didn't materialize. The Fair Employment Practices Commission's well-publicized hearings did open up new jobs to African Americans and Mexican Americans, both in the companies it investigated and in others that didn't want the negative publicity associated with a hearing. But the agency had no enforcement powers. It could publicize instances of discrimination, but it could not punish them. And in some cases, political maneuvering kept it from even holding hearings in the first place. The wartime rise in employment rates that I just mentioned ultimately didn't change the fact that the majority of Black Americans, Black American workers, were still trapped in menial jobs. Black workers did make gains on the shop floor, but they often had to fight tooth and nail for them, not only against their employers, but frequently against their own white co-workers and their own unions as well. This propaganda poster presents an image of racial unity in the nation's defense plants that is similar to the one depicted in the War Manpower Commission poster that I just showed you a minute ago. You know, these workers here seem to be effectively cooperating, you know, motivated by a, a common devotion to the war effort. But the reality of workplace integration was often, you know, quite a bit messier than this image would suggest. At the Packard plant in Detroit, which produced tanks, efforts to transfer small numbers of Black workers to skilled positions on the assembly line repeatedly led to white workers walking off a job or launching sit-down hate strikes, which always ended with the removal of the Black workers. When union officials refused to condemn the hate strikes, Black members launched their own walkout. As soon as they got back to work, White assembly line workers struck because they were there and the entire plant shut down. At this point, the War Labor Board intervened, suspended 30 strike leaders, white and black, ordered everybody else back to work. But the only individual in this whole situation with the Packard plant to be threatened with the draft was Christopher Alston, the union steward who had organized the black walkout. When Alston refused to back down on his demand that the company hire Black women, he was fired, drafted, sent to the Aleutian Islands all very quickly. And this kind of tension wasn't limited just to Detroit. Similar hate strikes launched in opposition to even small-scale desegregation also shut down workplaces in Philadelphia, Chicago, Baltimore, in Philadelphia, the, the nation's third largest war production hub, the strikers were white transit workers who walked out in August 1944 after the Philadelphia Transit Company finally took some tentative steps toward complying with FEPC regulations by promoting eight-ish Black men to trolley car drivers. After three days of stalemate, which kept hundreds of thousands of workers in the city's, you know, all important defense plants and shipyards from getting to work. The army marched into Philadelphia and took over control of the transit company. This time, the threat of loss of draft deferments and blacklisting by the War Manpower Commission was leveled against the white strikers, and they folded. Tensions over housing also flared during the war. As Black migration to Northern industrial centers ballooned, residents found themselves confined even more intensely to neighborhoods that were already bursting at the seams. Those who ventured outside traditionally Black neighborhoods in search of housing encountered violence and harassment, um, discriminatory mortgage practices, restrictive covenants, which barred homeowners from selling or renting to individuals of members of certain racial groups or, or ethnic groups or religious groups. 
the small handful of prosperous Blacks who managed to find a way around redlining and restrictive covenants and move into white neighborhoods during World War II encountered so much violence and harassment that most ultimately gave up, um, usually selling their new homes at a loss. Renters faced problems too. When housing officials in Detroit announced a new public housing project in 1941, the Sojourner Truth Homes that would provide housing for black war workers, white residents in the neighborhoods surrounding the chosen site demanded that it should be a white project instead. In the face of public outcry, housing officials flip-flopped at least three times on the truth homes. First, it was gonna be a black project, then a white project, then a black project again. When black families finally moved into their new homes in the winter of 1942, white vigilantes were waiting for them and a full-scale battle broke out, uh, requiring the governor to send in the National Guard. In the wake of the disturbance, the Detroit Housing Commission promised that public housing projects would never again change the racial composition of a neighborhood, so thus reinforcing segregation in a very official way. The racial tensions building in Detroit during World War II were so pronounced that Life magazine ran a banner headline in 1942 sort of proclaiming that Detroit is dynamite. It can either blow up Hitler or blow up the US. The situation in the city came to a head in June 1943 when fights between white and black teenagers at Belle Isle Park sparked rumors of a race war. Over the course of three days, rioters looted stores and private homes and, and attacked passersby. 34 people were killed, 25 of them black, and hundreds were injured. Detroit police openly sympathized with white rioters often standing by doing nothing in scenes like this one. Over the course of the riot, police officers killed 17 African-Americans, but not a single white person. And Detroit was just one of the 47 American cities to experience a race riot just in 1943. So that's a quick overview of just some of the ways that this tension between wartime promise and wartime reality played out for African-Americans um, on the home front. If we shift our attention now over to the military, we see similar patterns at work. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that men like Joe Lewis and Dory Miller were used as symbols to attract Black recruits to a still segregated military. That, of course, suggests that Black recruits were needed and wanted but this was not really the case in the weeks and months after Pearl Harbor. Army officials initially calculated that black troops would make up about 10% of the US Army. And when numbers rose beyond that, they started turning volunteers away on the grounds that the Army didn't have the facilities to train them and that their presence in large numbers might demoralize white troops. Navy recruiters responded similarly, continuing to accept Black men only in the roles they had pre-war. Those who had desperately needed skill sets in other areas, you know, like typing or auto repair, were turned away on the grounds that there was no place for them in the U.S. Navy. However, like with is so often the case with anything pertaining to war, as casualties increase, calculations change. Um, and ultimately most service branches over the course of the war came to see black recruits as an asset, not a liability. In the end, more than a million black men and women served across every branch of the military. But simply opening the doors to service didn't guarantee equal treatment, You know, far from it. Black troops were forced to train and function largely in segregated units. They regularly faced substandard conditions in their camps. They rarely had access to the recreational facilities that were standard for white soldiers. Over the course of the war, the majority of Black units were assigned to supply, engineering, and transportation roles. And these are important roles, definitely, but Black troops were disproportionately overrepresented in them. Most men, white and black, who enlisted in the US military during World War II 
envision serving in combat roles, but only about 12% of Black servicemen actually did. The story of the Port Chicago 50 is, is kind of emblematic of the struggles of many Black service members. For the majority of the war, Black sailors were used primarily as a source of manual labor. Many did the work of stevedores, you know, loading cargo onto ships. At California's Port Chicago Naval Magazine, the cargo was munitions. The safety regulations were non-existent, and the work was repeatedly speeded up to meet quotas. A disastrous explosion ripped through the magazine in July of 1944, killing more than 300 people and, and wounding almost 400 more. About two-thirds of the dead and wounded were African-American. And this is just sort of a picture of, of the scale of the devastation. Surviving unit members were quickly transferred to a different facility and told to get back to work under similar conditions. Most of them refused, arguing that they had never been adequately trained for this work in the first place, that safety regulations were still non-existent even after the explosion, and that the Navy was treating them as expendable because they were Black. 50 sailors who refused to back down were court-martialed on charges of disobeying orders and inciting a mutiny, which is a very serious charge for what was in reality a work stoppage. The men received lengthy prison sentences um, for their refusal to return to work. Ultimately, they were released in 1946 and sent to sea for the remainder of their enlistments, but their convictions were never overturned. So resistance didn't often take such dramatic form as it did at Port Chicago, but discontent within the ranks was common. Black members of the Women's Army Corps stationed at Fort Riley in Kansas complained in a desperate anonymous letter to the NAACP that their white company commander, a, a former prison guard, treated them like prisoners, not soldiers. Soldiers at an airfield in Florida wrote the Chicago Defender that they hadn't had a square meal in weeks and that they were being refused access to medical care. The National NAACP office received so many complaints of discrimination, um, abuse, inadequate food and medical care from soldiers stationed around the country that at the end of 1944, it asked branches located near military bases to undertake a systemic evaluation of their conditions. In deference to local Jim Crow policies, a lot of Southern base commanders restricted Black soldiers to base so that their presence in local communities wouldn't upset white residents. Those who did get local leave were often attacked by gangs of white civilians. Some were lynched while still in uniform. Some of the service members um, attacked attracted attention for you know doing things like refusing to move to the back of the bus, using a white restroom, or defending a Black woman from the advances of whites. Others were targeted simply because their attackers resented seeing people of color in U.S. Army uniforms. Um, the Durham, North Carolina area was the scene of a, a great deal of racial conflict during the war years, including um, but one of the bases near Durham was Camp Butner, which was a training facility for Black recruits. And there were a number of stories associated with the men of uh, men of Camp Butner, but in the interest of time, I just want to tell you one. Um, on July 8th, 1944, Private Booker Spicely, who was stationed at, at Butner, boarded a bus driven by Herman Council. As the bus approached a stop where two white soldiers were waiting, Council ordered Spice Lee and the handful of other Black passengers on board to give up their seats and move to the back of the bus. Spice Lee refused, and as the white soldiers climbed on board, he appealed to them as comrades in uniform. Why should he have to give up his seat? I thought I was fighting this war for democracy, he told them. Aren't I just as good to stop a bullet as you are? After a bit of back and forthing, the white soldiers agreed that he shouldn't have to get up to make room for them. And taking it one step further, gingerly moved toward the back of the bus themselves and took seats in the black section. 
now furious at this obvious flouting of racial boundaries on both sides, Council began to swear at all of the soldiers. And as Spicely reluctantly moved toward the back to sit with the white soldiers, he mumbled under his breath, if you weren't 4F, you wouldn't be driving this bus. So, you know, in the middle of a war that was as broadly supported by the American public as World War II was, to call a man 4F, you know, unfit for military service, was to insult not only his patriotism, but also his masculinity. And it's clear that Spicely realized that, you know, things had taken a really dangerous turn. When he stood up to get off, he apologized to counsel and he tried to make a quick exit. But the driver grabbed a pistol that he had under his seat. He followed Spicely off the bus, shot and killed him in full view of every passenger on the bus. He then got back on the bus and finished his route before turning himself in to the police. So Booker Spicely's siblings really wrestled with the question of what did it mean to secure justice for their brother? I mean, should they focus solely on getting a murder conviction, which frankly seemed highly unlikely, or did it mean, you know, using the legal system and the media to prosecute those who treated Black lives as disposable? You know, choosing that second option would mean bringing in lawyers from the NAACP, which would stir up local whites' fear of outside agitators and almost certainly guarantee that counsel would be acquitted. In the end, Spicely's brother, Robert, ultimately decided to do, in his own words, to do the thing which will minimize the frequency of such occurrences in the future, in the belief that if somebody had done this in the past, my brother would be alive today. The rising star NAACP lawyer Thurgood Marshall, who 10 years later would argue the Brown v. Board of Education case, came to Durham to help prosecute Herman Council. But the outcome was as expected. An all white jury deliberated for 30 minutes before acquitting Council on the grounds that he killed Spicely in self defense. So, stories like this are far too common, but there were there were bright spots. There were base commanders who encouraged both the soldiers on base and local whites to treat black soldiers with respect. There were some who permitted de facto integration of their recreational facilities before the War Department finally ordered that in, in 1943. Pressure on the Secretary of the Navy finally led to the inclusion of a small handful of African American men in the officer corps by early 1944, and the commissioning of the, I'm sorry, this is, I got behind, this is Booker Spicely, and the commissioning of the Navy's um, first two Black female officers later that year. As I think many of you probably know, the Army Air Corps established a training school for Black pilots at Tuskegee Institute in 1941. The Marine Corps began accepting African Americans for service for the first time in its history. The following year, in December of 1942, one of those first Black Marines, a man named Edgar Huff, was arrested while on leave, uh, well, accosted and arrested while on leave by two Marine MPs. And they tore up his furlough papers, they threw him in jail for impersonating a Marine. He was there for five days before his commanding officer was able to get him out. The, 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 uh, the MPs' defense was, there simply cannot be such a thing as a Black Marine. Edgar Huff went on to become a career Marine. He was one of the first Black non-coms in the Corps. He supervised all the drill instructors on his base, and he was promoted to first sergeant in the summer of 1944 before shipping overseas to serve in the Pacific. And this is him drilling troops at Camp Montford Point, um, probably 43 or, or 44. So very quickly, um, by late 1944, Black combat units were still a distinct minority, but 22 of them were fighting in the European theater. The Alabama-trained pilots of the 99th Pursuit Squadron and the 332nd uh, Fighter Group, you know, the Tuskegee Airmen, were flying missions across Central Europe so competently that even white racists had to acknowledge their impressive success rate. On the ground, the 761st Tank Battalion fought its way through France and Belgium and Holland with Patton. The men in this unit were some of the first Americans to encounter and liberate concentration camps. 
So it is clear that the military's need for black soldiers resulted in some important, some important challenges to white supremacy throughout the war years. But in many other instances, military authorities stubbornly upheld traditional racial practices. Um, blood supplies remained segregated throughout the war, despite the fact that leaders at all levels agreed that there was no scientific reason to segregate plasma. You know, this wasn't about science. This was about placating outspoken white members of Congress who were hyper concerned about any kind of racial mixing. Um, the, the NAACP fought really hard against this, um, but ultimately unsuccessfully on the grounds that a nation fighting against a war against Nazi Germany really ought to draw the line at seeming to endorse, you know, Nazi notions of racial blood. The same theories that about racial difference that led some whites to demand segregated plasma also provided the foundation for continued white fears of interracial dating and interracial marriage. Many military authorities shared these fears and refused permission for soldiers under their command to marry partners of different racial backgrounds. In October of 1944, a black soldier stationed somewhere in England submitted all the paperwork required to marry a local woman, including a letter of permission from her parents. But his application was rejected on grounds that such an action is against public policy. And the soldier appealed, arguing that interracial marriages were legal in England, they were legal in some parts of the United States, and furthermore, the objection against public policy, he wrote, is dubious from a moral and religious point of view. I am the father of our expected child. It is morally right for me to provide a home for the child and the mother. It's poor public policy that opposes what is morally right. This is an eloquent plea, but his application was again denied and the paper trail goes cold after that. So just, just sort of to wrap up, um, something that often gets lost in discussions of the black experience during World War II is that many white Americans, including a sizable number of Northerners, also embraced a sort of a white supremacist form of double V, linking their struggle to preserve the traditional racial order to victory in the war. In their minds, the United States was not fighting a war for democracy, but rather a war for states' rights, or as they put it, for the right of individual lands not to be invaded by outsiders, not to be dictated to or aggressed against. And these men and women saw every civil rights gain of the war as part of a, a massive conspiracy to destroy traditional values and white racial purity. For many of them, the renewed activism on the part of the National Committee to abolish the poll tax was the final straw. For those who opposed it, the poll tax was an affront to democracy. You know, it deprived African Americans and poor white Southerners of a voice in their government. But for its defenders, it was the key to Southern power in Congress, and it was defended as such. In response to the push for its removal, a rash of lynchings spread across Mississippi and whites in the heavily black parts of the state organized vigilance committees to discourage black residents from challenging traditional racial practices. The campaign went down in defeat and the vigilance committees served as seeds for the white citizens councils that swept across the South 10 years later in the wake of the Brown v. Board decision. Most Americans know that the GI Bill, you know, passed in 1944, was one of the most important legacies of World War II. The bill offered veterans college tuition, you know, low-cost home loans, unemployment insurance, but it benefited whites far more than blacks, to the point that some historians have argued that the GI Bill did more than any other factor to widen the already huge racial gap in post-war United States. The mortgage loans, that, those were dead on arrival for Blacks, as both the Veterans Administration and the Federal Housing Administration considered Black borrowers inherently a bad risk, regardless of their income or financial history. For the educational benefits, 95% of Black veterans who attempted to use them 
were funneled toward black colleges, many of which at the time were severely overcrowded and unaccredited. Black men who applied for the unemployment benefits were kicked out of the program if any other work was available to them, even if it paid almost nothing. Southern postmasters were even accused of refusing to deliver the forms that Black veterans needed to fill out to get their unemployment benefits. Racial violence against returning Black veterans was intense, although not nearly as common as it had been after World War I. Most of the men, most of the victims were men like uh, Maceo Snipes or Isaac Woodard. After returning from the war, Snipes became the first Black resident in Taylor County, Georgia, to successfully register to vote. He was shot 24 hours after casting his first ballot, and he died two days later. No one was ever charged. Woodard was on his way home after being discharged from the Army when he got into an argument with a bus driver in South Carolina. The police officers who responded to the driver's call beat Woodard who was still in uniform so badly that they left him permanently blind. That, that's him in the middle of the picture. Black veterans were targets because many returned from the war determined to continue fighting for double V and to not accept second-class citizenship. They challenged segregation in public spaces and demanded space for their families in public housing. They turned out in large numbers to register, to attempt to register to vote took out memberships in the NAACP, you know, added their names to lawsuits, demanded pay raises, better treatment from employers, attempted to make use of the GI Bill to further their education. Within 20 years, World War II veterans like Aaron Henry, Amzi Moore, and Medgar Evers were at the helm of some of the major civil rights campaigns of the 1960s. So, all in all, by the late 1940s, the stage was set for the transformative events of the next two decades. While many white Americans continued to cling to white supremacy, others, particularly veterans who had had close contact with African-American service members, left military service with some new ideas about race and democracy. Motivated in part by this violence against Black veterans, Harry Truman created the President's Committee on Civil Rights in 1946 to investigate the extent of racial discrimination in the United States and propose some measures to combat it. In response to the committee's report, as well as a, a bunch of other factors, Truman issued two executive orders on civil rights during his time in the White House. The first ordered an end to discrimination in the federal government, and the second began the process of desegregating the armed forces, although widespread transformation on the ground didn't come until the, the height of the Korean War. Truman also made the decision to support the inclusion of a civil rights plank in the Democratic Party's 1948 platform. And in response, white Southerners bolted from the party to form the state's rights party, you know, better known as the Dixiecrat Party. The Dixiecrats platform was, and their candidate, Strom Thurmond, was a foreshadowing of the resistance to come as the civil rights movement moved into its next phase. And its chosen symbol, the Confederate flag, was a banner that would gain new life as a symbol of massive resistance as the movement moved into that new phase. So that's what I have uh, for today, but I'd be very happy to try to take some questions and, and, and chat about things that you might be interested in. Great. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating and really wonderful information. I'm so happy that you uh, took time today to do this. Thank you. Um, just quickly, so we have a few questions already in, and if anyone will, has any questions, please put them in the Q&A box, and I will um, read them for Professor Titus. So Mark had a question about Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, was she ever involved in any effort to desegregate the military or uh, or and elsewhere, and were there any other key white figures involved in this? Yes, Eleanor Roosevelt was definitely involved. She was she was one of FDR's most sort of central go-betweens between A. Philip Randolph and his allies and the White House. And she, as on as as you know, disagreed with her husband on many political issues, um, and and always pushed him to take more definitive stands on on behalf of civil rights. So yes, she 
she was she was pushing for acceptance of both of Randolph's demands, you know, an executive order that would deal with this, this discrimination in the workplace and one that would have more teeth and desegregation of the of the military. Um, and in terms of what I mentioned about that sort of white supremacist form of double V, a lot of those individuals became sort of fixated on Eleanor Roosevelt as this race trader and, and really overestimated her role in certain ways to the point that there were many white Southerners passionately believed that during World War II, Eleanor Roosevelt had orchestrated the development of Eleanor clubs across the South where black domestic servants were being like, were, were being told to disobey their employers and to push white people into the street and to do all sorts of things and orchestrate this like coordinated um, subversive campaign. You know, there's absolutely no proof of anything like that. But yes, Eleanor Roosevelt was was most definitely was most definitely a, a, a supporter. Great. Uh, Daniel was asking about hate strike. Um, the something that you mentioned he wanted to know which side coined this term so the the term itself that's that's a really good question i'm not actually sure to what ex, to what extent that term was used by contemporaries and to what extent that is a term that historians have given it but but the idea being a strike that is motivated by resistance to other um, resistance to new employees being promoted or African Americans being brought into you know higher level positions or being um, being uh, compensated at a higher level. So some of these strikes were actively called by union leadership. Others were wildcat strikes, meaning that they were not specifically organized and condoned by union leadership. Uh, all right, uh, more questions. <laughs> we can probably do a few more. Um, Leonard wanted to know, did the judge in the Spicely criminal case uh, later preside in one of the desegregation cases that became part of Brown versus the Board of Education? So I think what you might be asking is Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was the lawyer who, uh, the, the lawyer, the, the NAACP lawyer who prosecuted the case on, um, on behalf of Spicely's family. So he was not the judge, he was the prosecuting attorney. And yes, he was the lead prosecutor for the NAACP in the Brown v. Board of Education case, and then later appointed to the Supreme Court himself. Um, and Bob wanted to know, on the same lines of, uh, while we're talking about legal and investigations, <laughs> was there ever um, any congressional investigation or high level examination of the Port um, Chicago explosion? That's a really good question. And it's, um, there, there has never been a sort of a full fledged congressional investigation so far as I know, but efforts to get one and efforts to, um, and to overturn the convictions of these men continue. I think that there actually, I think there's been movement on that just in the last two years or so. Um, a very small handful of those men are, are still alive. And I think we're probably going to be out of time. I mean, we can continue the conversation in the, in the course that's coming up. I believe it starts March 9th with Professor Titus. Um, I'm going to drop the link to the course in the chat window now. And if you register today, you will get a signed copy of Professor Titus's book. Um, or you can buy the book on its own at our website. That link is in the chat as well. And I want to thank you so much, Professor Titus, because th this was absolutely incredible, really fascinating. And I have to tell you, too, our social channels were going crazy over the topic. People were really interested, had a lot of questions, and are going to love watching this presentation. And I just want to turn it over to you to see if you have any final remarks, if you want to talk about your course quickly or or anything at all. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and spending part of your day um, talking about this with me. And thank you for the really good questions. Um, I look forward to the course. The, the course is kind of structured around the idea of how, what are some of the basic misconceptions out there about what this mid-20th century civil rights movement 
was, if we looked at things in a new light, what might we see that we didn't see before? And, and why are some of the misconceptions that are popularly held about the movement problematic for us as a nation as we continue to struggle with racial injustice? So we're going to talk broadly about those themes. We're also going to zero in specifically on the Montgomery bus boycott, on um, Freedom Summer of 1964, on the two Black Panther parties, the, the one that everybody knows about and the one that not so many people know about, and the, the long history of school desegregation beyond Brown and beyond the U.S. South. Wow. Thank you so much. Really great. And I'm looking forward to our, the March course. And Again, thank you all for joining and thank you so much. We will see you in March, Professor Titus. Wonderful. I look forward to it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.